for those of you who haven't been to New America before, um, we're a community both physically here in DC, but also virtually across the country of problem solvers who are dedicated to renewing the idea of, new, of America in the digital age. And it's really only fitting that we're hosting this book conversation um, because uh, it's part of how we think about solving problems is with a new set of tools that goes beyond the white paper or an analysis, a budgetary analysis. Um, I can't say enough about these two authors and about this book. So I'm going to hold mine up and wave it around. Um, I'm going to ask for mine to be signed at the end of this event. <laughs> um, I, you know, the message that's here um, is profoundly useful, whether you are leading in government or you are leading in a completely different um, context from the private sector to, frankly, if you were doing something to better your community, there is something for everyone in this book. If you weren't sure about hacking a bureaucracy and you just wanted the best collection of great motivational quotes, this is for, <laughs> this is the, each chapter I was like, that's a good one too, I'm gonna save that one. Um, in writing a book myself, I realized that there's like generally a crowd of people who uh, do things and a crowd of people who write books and it's very rare that you find true doers who write truly great books and you have two here. Um, there, it, this is like, they're so good it's so good to read. It's totally accessible. It tackles things in a way that leaves you a short list behind if you don't know what to do. So I can't say enough about how grateful I am to be here with these two, to listen in, um, and that this is really in the ethos of what we do. So if, you, you know, uh, if you're trying to hack your own bureaucracy and you get stuck, come back to the new practice lab in New America. Um, Marina Nitsa, Nick Sinai, you, you know, this, this team needs no further introduction. Um, and in, in the category of getting stuck and needing help, the work that the team at Tech Talent is doing um, in drawing in the types of leaders and with the skills that Marina has described is remarkable. So let's jump into conversation. I'm going to put down the mic. Thank you, everyone. Um, and let's get started. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. My name is Angelica. Most people know me as Angie. I lead the Federal Partnerships Portfolio with Tech Talent Project. And in my role, I do matchmaking. I help bring in technical executives into the federal space and then support them once they're in. This is your onboarding book. This, this is the book that you have to get. It has all the tips uh, for you to be able to be successful and effective when you're in government and especially in a new role. So I'm happy to be here and, and have this conversation with Nick and Marina because whether they know it or not, when I was in a different role in the state of California, I followed a lot of the practices that they actually wrote about in this novel. Uh, and in the middle of bureaucracy hacking uh, in the state of California, I think there was one instance, I forget what I was working on, and I got an email from Marina and she, I don't know if you remember this, but you gave me props. And I was like, I didn't even know she knew me. <laughs> oh my goodness, no, but I think um, the, the reason why I'm mentioning that right now is because it really spoke to me. Uh, and, and some of the lessons that you capture here is exactly the type of culture and, and cultivating the caress, as you point in your book, that I wanna build into events like this. I want to be able to bring people together, executives and non-executives that are working on challenging and complicated problems so that you know that you're not alone in solving that complicated and challenging problem and that there's others that have been in your shoes that will be more than happy to support you. Um, so thank you for, for being here and for, for telling the stories. Uh, I was hoping maybe we could kick off the conversation by talking a little bit more about what, what is the favorite story that you can think of? Well, first of all, tell us about the book. And then what is the story that you can think of that really exemplifies how policy and product are really interconnected? I think that's something that uh, a lot of executives in general don't really, especially in government, don't, aren't able to understand. So I'm hoping that we can unpack that a little bit more. Can I tell the origin of the book? Okay. Uh, we're still perfecting our, our shebang together. Uh, so the book, I uh, joined the federal government in 2012 as part of the first class of Presidential Innovation Fellows. And I did so as a libertarian who believed that government should be blown up. It did not work. It was all broken. There was no saving it. Um, and then Nick tricked me to come into the government uh, as a, a fellow. And I was completely wrong. 
right? I saw people around me that were making change at a scale that was unimaginable to me in my previous life as a business process re-engineer for like small to mid-sized companies. And uh, I joined Nick's team at the White House, uh, began auditing the VA's use of technology as part of processing disability claims, and then a year to the day of joining the government as a fellow became the CTO of the VA, where I stayed for five years and did some things like help found the US Digital Service. Um, but the book really came out of a number of lessons that I saw people that just kept working and also a number of mistakes that I made uh, and learned that that don't do that do this instead and this is what worked and I want people to be more effective I want them to be more effective uh, in their PTAs in their businesses in the government in HOAs although I think my new position on HOAs is I want you to be effective at joining your HOA to end it because they all suck um, but generally speaking the rest of the bureaucracies you shouldn't blow up uh, and uh, we really just wanted to make accessible stories of people who, uh, despite some maybe impressive job titles that I've had, I really never had any amount of hard power of any kind. I joined the VA with zero people, zero dollar budget, zero resources, um, and it's about what you can do from wherever you are to get stuff done. So I spent four years in uh, the presidency, in the executive office of the president, and just about every day, outside people would come to us and say, the president ought to say this, the president ought to do this, the, the, the president should write an executive order that does this, right? Like that was just par for the course. And, and our office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, had a lot of external engagement and we, we cultivated uh, a, a lot of uh, outside actors. Uh, but it meant that you got a lot of those requests all the time. And to your, your question about, about policy, to me, it was pretty clear that the way to get the president to write an executive order was to create the conditions on the ground where the president would be excited to write that executive order. Uh, and it would codify some really good stuff. Or, you know, in a crisis and you're directing some, some things, some changes, right? Um, and so I guess I have a more of a entrepreneurial or bottoms up approach to change rather than this idea of, well, the change has got to start from the top. It's just kind of a, a, a maybe it's because I, the, the other thing that was interesting to me is uh, I really enjoyed being in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, but it was not the highest ranking policy council inside the presidency. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh so much. <laughs> uh, but so we knew that to get stuff done, you know, it had to be the National Economic Council, the National Security Council, even o OMB had tremendous statutory uh, power. And so, you know, our low rankingness inside the presidency was actually a superpower. And, you know, so we had to learn how to make things other people's idea, how to partner inside and outside, how to use uh, external commitments, presidential commitments as tools. And we wrote down a number of these sayings on a whiteboard, which we actually kept for eight years. I only served four years in that particular office, but after eight years, they broke some rules and took that whiteboard out of out, out of, out of uh, the old executive office building. Um, and a lot of those sayings were ones that, uh, you know, we, we really uh, internalized. Uh, and they were things like the, the uh, um, hacks versus wonks. So really understanding the different guilds in, in the White House was helpful. To understand, like, the policy wonks, which we were uh, part of, we uh, oftentimes did not have appreciation for the comms function. And if you really got to understand the, the comms pe people, which we affectionately called hacks, uh, there's a story of me insulting David Gergen to his face in front of 100 people, uh, calling him a hack. Uh, but we meant it affectionately, and really understanding where they were coming from in terms of framing solutions for the American people and how important storytelling is, especially in the presidency. So anyway, these, these series of, 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 of tactics and sayings uh, um, many of them learned the hard way. Many of them learned watching people come in and try and make change and fail. Um, and so we incorporated a number of them in the book. Boy, policies that, and, and how they, I, you know, a, a rant I could go on easily for forever from my VA time and now definitely my foster care time is that people write policies with great intention. And if you don't think through and ideally test through how it will be implemented, it can easily fall apart or cause great harm. Um, I will 
do a couple rants in case somebody watching can fix one of these problems. Currently in foster care, it is against the law in Maryland for a foster child to sleep in a bunk bed. The person who wrote that law meant well. They wanted foster children to have their quote unquote own bed and own rooms and perhaps a puppy. But what this means is there are kids sleeping on the office floor or in group homes with available grandparents right now who cannot get past the state law about bunk beds. So I'm working on fixing that. But I think that we see a lot of a lot of uh, policies that pass that uh, have great intention, but uh, and we think we saw that during the pandemic. I mean, Tara and I worked a ton on unemployment, uh, and we saw you know Congress, for example, passing PUA that was uh, with I'm going to say great intention to really help people in a, in a crisis, and the implementation got really mangled as people missed up the details or didn't appreciate that in most states there's like one or two people who can change the rules of the entire unemployment mainframe, and they also have like 17 other jobs. And so when you change the logic every other Thursday, um, you actually made it pretty untenable for them, whereas if you gave them more of like a mad lib, like, hey, you, Congress, you can change like the dollar amount and this other thing, but the, the code logic has to be the same. It could have been a much, much different outcome. Yeah, I'm a fan of, of this idea of human-centered policymaking. Um, and uh, there, there's a story, actually, we didn't put in the book, of, of the MACRA implementation. So this is kind of how uh, Medicare pays doctors for, for uh, quality rather than just volume. And Congress had passed legislation, and CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, has to uh, pass a series of rules and implement this program. Uh, and Mina Shung, who is the current uh, USDS administrator, she was at CMS at the time, and uh, the story of how she works with uh, um, doctors, many of which were planning to quit. I mean, she, they, were, they did interviews and they understood that uh, if implemented poorly um, and if implemented exactly as how Congress had written it, uh, it would have been a disaster. And so how can they, as they're writing the rules, also test what the implementation is going to be like so that the rules are written better and that the rules are actually written more flexibly so that implementation can c continue to evolve with uh, doctor needs, because it's mostly a payment program for doctors. Yeah, one of my favorite um, stories during the pandemic response was really trying to figure out how do you communicate the well -intended to, with the, to the well-intended politician that their policy is great, but there are people in the room that need to focus on the how, right? Like we need to figure out the how do you get it done. And so it's a balance between really making sure that you have the solid policy intent and then bringing the people together to execute on, on that vision. Um, oftentimes that's also more successful when you have air cover and that's the other theme that I was hoping to unpack in our conversation here. I know I had a ton of air cover in my prior role uh, in, in the state of California and it helped me a lot because I was able to execute on other things and build a great team and a great culture by being able to have the backing and the coaching of a mentor um, who provided air cover when I needed it. Uh, what can you speak to the stories that you've written in terms of being able to bring air cover into some of the implementations that, that you have shared? Uh, I think it's important. So uh, as Nick mentioned, you know, we watched a lot of people that were extremely amazing professionals in other lives come into some of the big bureaucracies like the VA, et cetera, and also and flame out. And I think a reason was sometimes that they misunderstood what air cover provides. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll just touch on that first, which is air cover is not exceptions to the rule. Air cover does not mean you don't have to follow like law or things. Air cover is you know the support. Um, of your senior leaders um, and, and maybe a nudge or maybe a little bit of a budget boost, but it's not, it doesn't mean that you get to uh, sidestep the whole process. And pretty regularly at the VA, when I would have a new hire, they would come in and they'd be like, great, why don't we just ask for like a, a memo that says that we don't have to you know, follow any of the rules and then we can just deploy all the code and fix all the problems. It's like, well, you can't, that doesn't exist. Um, in most bureaucracies, it does not, it does not exist. Um, but I was very, lucky to have some pretty amazing air cover, starting with Nick when I joined the government. Um, and some of air cover too is just that mentorship of explaining like what rules are, or what constraints are fixed and what constraints are like, you're gonna actually go to prison for this. Mm -hmm. And then what, what <laughs> rules are like Paperwork Reduction Act jail that like people talk about a lot, but I don't think exists. And also if it does exist, I kind of want to hang out there. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 
I think that um, sometimes I have needed air cover and, and not done a good enough job educating senior leaders how they can help me. And so we have a chapter on make it easy for the other person. And that includes making it easy for the senior leader, the okay. secretary or the administrator or so. so. And there are, there are times in my career when I've been that senior leader and tried to provide air cover. And I realize there's a question of trust and context and convenience. So do I trust this, this, this person? Uh, um, in many cases, I have recruited that person into government in a fellows program or some of this, but do I, do I trust them on what they are doing and that they have the, the judgment, right? The, the EQ, the technical judgment, the, the bureaucratic judgment, the mission judgment, all these kinds of judgments add together. So do I, do I trust that, right? Uh, but there's also a, an element of, is this the right strategy to provide them a lot of air cover? And then are they making it easy, right? Are they actually providing the, the, the talking points or, or the materials to arm me who's running around trying to, I mean, at one point I was uh, with Jen Palka running the Presidential Innovation Fellow Program and we had 40, felt we had expanded too fast in round two. And so we, ha we had 40 odd fellows and uh, Jen and I, mostly I, was not doing a good job of managing them. And we didn't have a program office yet set up in, in the General Services Administration. So it was a little chaotic and we're trying to provide air cover and help. And you, I could just see the, the, the limits of, of air cover uh, as well as the opportunities when you really did it right. There is a great story, which we did not put in the book, um, of uh, convincing White House counsel that it was okay to put Presidential Innovation Fellows in the IRS and that we were not gonna get in the news and not cause any trouble. And sure enough, they helped build the first modern API so taxpayers could check their claim status. They helped get the 990 data open and available to the world. They did a bunch of important things uh, behind the scenes and I kept my word to White House counsel. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> um, I think to build on that, and you both mentioned in, in several chapters of your book, curating the crafts. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Okay, you, Nick, you just take them. I'll take it this time. So the crass, if you have not read Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut in the book, is the idea that uh, the universe has conspired to put different people on Earth to achieve a goal together. Um, and I, our late colleague, Jake Brewer, who was tragically killed in a bike accident when we, we were in, I already left for the VA, but you were still in OSDP, had kept this post-it note on his computer that said, cultivate the caress. So it has become sort of a, a mantra for many of us in his honor, but it really means that like, uh, that your caress is almost certainly not your org chart. There are, there are hidden people around. And I think when people are in bureaucracies, they're often complaining to me, and this has been like a constant Q&A as we've been on this book tour of like, well, all these people are conspiring to stop me. They're, they're afraid I'm going to take their job. They're afraid computers are going to automate them away. Like they're, they're intentionally slow rolling me or, or getting in my way or whatever. And I think a much healthier perspective to take is that like the universe has hidden helpers for you around your bureaucracy and you just have to find them. They may have been people who tried your idea 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever it may be, and may have some insights into what didn't work that time and what might be different this time. Or they may just have a different perspective or skill set to lend. Um, one of my favorite caress uh, building moments was I had an opportunity to get my first budget at the VA. I had zero dollars and I was supposed to <laughs> redefine the art of the possible for how America honors and serves its veterans. So no big deal. Uh, and I was trying to get money and, and one way to do it was if I could help shut down this $27 million behemoth IT contract, which is a website full of content, I could get some of the cost savings redirected to my budget. And so I had to move a thousand pages of, of content from one page to another, and I didn't have any, any staff to do it, but I did notice that the security guards seemed to have a little bit of time on their hands. So offered if anybody wanted to come to a lunch and learn, I would teach them HTML, and they could help me with my project. And then, like, boy, are the security guards in a building also the best, best friends that you should have, possibly only next to exec sec. Uh, and so they all, like, learned HTML. They helped me meet my budget. I got a few million dollars of, of budget because they helped me meet my timeline. And then they all left being security guards to become IT professionals. So everybody's better off, I guess. <laughs> but you just never know where your caress will be. Yeah. And I think to build on that, I know, Nick, you talk about the stone soup approach. 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of, of Stone Soup. So we, we titled the chapter Act As If. And so it's this parable, I think it's a European folk story about a traveler who comes to a village and asks for a meal and the villagers say no. And so the enterprising uh, traveler gets a big cauldron somehow. I don't know like, <laughs> where, where, where he or she gets this cauldron, but uh, basically starts heating up some water. And a kind of a curious villager comes by and the, the, the traveler explains making stone soup, and delicious stone soup, and it's so hearty and good and just paints this picture and says, oh, you know, but I'm missing a carrot. Like, would you, you know, would you mind just giving me one of your carrots? You have five, could I just have one of them? And convinces this first villager uh, uh, to give a carrot. And then, of course, another villager comes by and, and the traveler describes this amazing soup uh, and, and, and manages to get an onion. And it goes on and on and on until at the end, uh, it's a really delicious soup that, that the traveler shares with the entire village. So a lot of people see, see this as a parable about sharing and, and community, which it may be, but I, I've always thought of that story as a, a story about entrepreneurship inside of organizations. And, and that what you're really trying to do is get that first uh, villager to give you that first carrot, uh, because that's social proof. And in large organizations, it's hard for a global no, right? The secretary, the president of the United States, the general counsel, sure, there are legal things, but if you're starting up a project, an initiative, uh, whatever you're trying to do, it just may be that that particular leader can't give you uh, um, resources, time, attention. But what you want is just a little bit of social proof because that helps get additional social proof. Uh, and that was a tactic that we used in the start of the U.S. Digital Core. So the U.S. Digital Core, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an early career uh, tech project uh, where, where we recruit early career technical feds for two years, housed in GSA, but then placed in agencies. Uh, it's a really exciting, you know, over 1,000 folks apply and, and about 40 fellows in the first cohort. Um, and that was one of those things where we could have uh, essentially asked for per permission to start, but it was it was much easier if we went around and just asked for feedback on this, and and then agencies will say, hey, you know, if you're going to bring in some some early career engineers or designers or data scientists or cyber, depending on the agency, you know, I'm in. That sounds interesting, uh, and so we got some early carrots and built that social proof. So for folks that are online, you can start sending in your questions. For folks in the room, I see some of you already started submitting your questions through the QR code on your table. Um, so I'm going to take an opportunity to ask this question because it actually builds on what you just mentioned. Um, how do topics, how do the topics and techniques in the book overlap with or clash with the more traditional approach to change management? Uh, well, the change management that I've seen often focuses on trying to change people like inherently and there'll be like slide presentations or culture changes or, or uh, spaghetti towers like with marshmallows where you make the tallest one or the wise one or whatever. Um, and the only thing I've seen work is really changing the environment in which people are working. Like it's easy to think most people are either active supporters or active uh, like dissenters but I think most people are actually more in the middle and uh, they you know, maybe don't want to step too far out of the line of their position description or their performance reviews or the thing that will get them a step grade promotion. And if you can change that, then you can change the behaviors. Um, I also think it's dangerous sometimes when people come in, especially around technology, and they're like, oh, we're going to, you know, move everything to the cloud, um, which is maybe good, and there may be good arguments for reliability and dollar savings, et cetera. But if that person over the current server has been there for 30 years and is a GS 15 step 10 and they have built up that expertise and, and they are proud you know, of their career and their contributions and you come in and be like, I don't know, maybe you could take like a certification course this weekend um, and, and you're gonna turn them into a newbie in their role and they're suddenly not gonna be able to navigate or, or do basic things. That's really threatening in a way that I think people do not appreciate. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about the innovation word and I used to teach a class called Tech and Innovation in Government at the, at, the, at the Kennedy School. Uh, our former boss, Todd Park, who was the second CTO in the Obama administration, 
would talk about the difference between shiny hood ornaments and actually fixing the engine. Uh, and it's, it's hard to fix the engine because nobody wants you to touch the engine because, you know, in any one of these agencies, they'll be like, if we don't send out the checks this week, we can cause a national recession, which is true, like at CMS and so, so, Social Security and, and et cetera. Um, and so the trick is, you know, how do, how do you do things that are, are not vanity hood ornament but are adjacent to the engine but actually may, may be uh, meaningful to the agency? Right? And so sometimes you can call that innovation, but sometimes you can call that other things as well. And so I, I just, uh, I'm a big believer in, in user-centered design. I'm a big believer in, in, in a lot of innovative or new techniques that we can bring to the uh, federal government. But I think sometimes these words are kind of loaded and, and, and sometimes we'll create a, a, a backlash uh, among many of the employees. Our friend Erie Meyer, who many of you know, has a quotation that I love, which is, innovation in government is answering the phone. <laughs> and I think more people should focus on, like, are we doing our basic service delivery? And then we'll talk about some fancy AI, machine learning, robot, or whatever. But Yeah, I, that resonates. Um, I think we have another question here. Do you have tips to deal with the frozen middle? I don't know what the frozen middle is. I don't know what the frozen middle is. It's from Anonymous. So. Uh, I think it's it's a uh, derogatory term for the middle of the bureaucracy, okay. where there's this. Uh, I don't know if this is right or not, but there's this. I hear this a lot in DoD, where I do a lot of work more recently, uh, where they're like, "Oh, well, the generals and admirals get it, and the young lieutenants and captains, but it's the it's the frozen middle. It's the colonels who are causing the problem, right?" Um, and so that's at least what that term means. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it still goes back to like changing the incentives. Uh, in the framework. Uh, when I was trying to get cloud computing approved at the VA, uh, one of the challenges was that the inspector general would not let us use the cloud because you could not put the cloud in an evidence bag. Uh, and it took two years of like working with them, educating them, showing them the alternatives they could do it before they issued what is, for me, the, my career highlight of my entire life, which was a memo saying that they preferred logical access over physical access to the cloud. Um, but other burdens I was trying to get there, I'm trying to fill out the paperwork and the, you know, very experienced VA IT people would not let me submit paperwork or I did not answer every question. And some of the questions like, Marina, did you promise that you jiggled the doorknob of the door of the cloud and the cloud does not have a door? Uh, I, w I left it blank. It came back to me. I tried to explain like metaphorically how I jiggled the doorknob. It was rejected to me. I tried to put not applicable. It was rejected to me. I tried to convince the ISO that like veterans were dying if, if they did not approve the form. The form was sent back to me. Uh, and what ultimately worked was changing the form itself. And now, eight years later, like the VA is a truly cloud first agency where it's actually much harder to have a physical server under your desk and the easy thing. And so if you change that paperwork, the process, the incentives, the performance review, the step grade promotion, I think that's how you change the frozen middle, and maybe they're not frozen so much as like people responding to incentives, and you need to change the risk and incentive framework for them, not expect them to just stick their neck out and potentially get fired or end up in an IG report. Mm -hmm. and, and make them champions when they unblock and help, even, even if they were initial skeptics. I think that's, yeah. uh, the, I like the, how about the grilled cheese? Yeah, we had a, our, our crass at the VA was, we called it the grilled cheese club. We definitely violated fire code because we had George Foreman grills in the office and we would make grilled cheeses <laughs> while we demoed just kind of what we were up to. And we invited anybody around the agency, if you were a security guard, all the way up to assistant secretaries, just to come and learn what we were up to, have a glass of wine in the middle of the day and uh, <laughs> have some grilled cheese. And it really, really helped because as one person or even as a team of, you know, maybe 20 people at the time, we couldn't be everywhere. And so when we were just kind of sharing and keeping people updated, I think that's another way that it helped them give us air cover mm -hmm. in ways they didn't expect because they were just informed. Um, I am someone who uh, is not always great at like proactively communicating about my projects because I'm like, I'm head down, I'm busy, I'm working. Why would I like write up what I'm up to and what the latest is? But it really, really helps so that someone isn't, um, if, if there is a problem later on, I don't now have to explain, well, there was this project and this is what it's for and this is what it's about and this is what happened. It's that project I've been talking to you about for nine months, we just hit this very specific roadblock. Yeah. Can you help me? Yeah, you were bringing them along. Yeah. I, I tend to be pretty bad at that. Of, <laughs> no, but it, it's, a, it's a learned skill of, uh, especially in large organizations, is 
uh, over communicating via uh, whether it's a listserv, whether it's email, whether it's, it's, it's updates, snippets, whatever it is, spreadsheets of just making sure you're writing it down and you're communicating uh, not in a way that you're bragging about your your thing, but that you are informing the 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 wide set of colleagues. Uh, and I'm also a fan of if 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 it's appropriate to be using a public comms strategy, uh, because if you are talking about your project, you can find other people in the agency who learn about it via uh, public comms and outside stakeholders, former employees. Uh, the field class I used to teach at the Kennedy School, one of the requirements for clients, and the VA was a client, City of Boston was a client, was that they, they had to be okay with the students blogging, mm -hmm. with me supervising and them supervising, about the project that they were working on. And so, so throughout the semester, the students would blog about the things they found when they went out and did a design sprint, when they were doing all, all of these things. And it, it taught them you know, that they could attract supporters inside the clients, as well as supporters and people who wanted to help. And so that kind of asymmetric information flow, if you can use a public comm strategy, not every tactic and project can, uh, but I, I found it, it, it's actually a really interesting way of even speaking to your own organization. I know I used that tactic when I led the Alpha team in the state of California. So that was a project that I led where I brought together a multidisciplinary team to reimagine what the front door of the state of California SCA.gov would look like. And uh, I, I gotta say, that was probably the one thing that made my sponsors the most nervous, was that we were going to blog on a weekly basis, what we were doing and what we were learning. And it actually ended up being one of the more successful pieces of Alpha, was being able to capture on a regular basis the progress of the work that we were doing who we were engaging, the technical aspects, really explaining why we were doing something versus not doing something. Uh, and I think it did help build community around those that were following the story. Um, so I recommend that. It's method. completely counter. Yeah. yeah, It's completely <laughs> counter to the way we, we do comms, right? So we're used to, we do the big announcement, right? The big press release. And then a couple years later when the thing actually works or we've delivered or we have results, then the big press release. So this idea of like, wait a second, we're gonna have this, this steady, ongoing in, in, engagement and be more transparent about our, our process. It's just, it's just not a normal muscle, but I think, I think it's really powerful and things we, we can do this outside of technology. Yeah, it really, really does bring people along in a different way. Yeah. Nick, given your work with students, how have you thought these tools and perspectives to your students and early career folks? Uh, so I love encouraging the students to get out of the office as we talk about it. Uh, get out of the classroom, I guess, would be more appropriate for, for when I teach it. And, and so in this field class where we're working with the city of Boston or, or VA or, or any one of these clients, uh, what happens is the students for the first couple weeks are developing the perfect interview guide. Right? So we're talking about user-centered design, human-centered design, and so they're, they're thinking about, okay, we're gonna go do this great interview. And they write up this, this uh, long interview guide, and then they get out in the field, and they're talking to Boston city residents, they're, they're, they're talking to city officials, they're talking to, to actual users out in the field, and of course, they learn so much, and the, the interview guide wasn't right. Uh, and, and, but they learn that, it's better to learn that in week one or week two, rather than going, you know, into week seven of a 12-week class, right? So I'm always trying to kick them out of the classroom as quickly as possible. In the, in the book, we, we tell the story of Berkeley Brown. She was an undergraduate, because I let a few undergraduates in, and, and uh, we embedded her in the gang unit in the city of Boston. Uh, so the police that go around and, 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 and deal with, with, with gangs. And so they, uh, that was quite the culture shock for her. Um, and then to come back to Harvard Square and just kind of, uh, it, it helped make things more real. It helped her understand the mission. And so you can, you can talk abstractly about, you know, tech policy as it's related to uh, various databases that these, these detectives would use. But you start to understand how, what safety means to people uh, and also what it means to pull over someone and, and have, have a negative interaction 
where it's it's ultimately supremely unfair and going to kind of point, poison their their perspective on on the police. And so you, you realize the, these set of questions around how to use a database have have real meaning, and to start there is is pretty powerful. Yeah, talk about perspective, right? Many senior leaders do not fully understand the capabilities of modern technology, which today enables policy execution. How can this challenge be an opportunity? Uh, you have to find ways for them to learn safely. So a senior executive is not going to raise their hand in a room of 100 people and say, what exactly is an API? Or like, what is the cloud? Or why is that better? Um, and they may not even ask you privately. So you need to find ways to make it safe for them to learn. Um, and our colleague Erie also is, is the, uh, has a story in the book that I love, which was the government was trying to put forth an API policy. And we were pretty sure that most agency CIOs did not know what APIs were. And we were also pretty sure that they weren't going to ask. Um, and so Erie held an event at the White House in the fancy room called APIs for Executives. Um, and I, at the VA, saw this invite being passed around like the senior leadership of people being like, oh, this is for us. This is a special mm -hmm. event for us. It's at the White House we're going to go. And then in, in that environment, uh, they're like, yeah, I know everybody knows what APIs are, but just in case, we're just going to do a little refresher. <laughs> uh, and it was a safe place for people to learn among their peers in a special environment, and it wasn't patronizing in any way. And I think that I think about that a lot, of how to make things safe to learn, because it's not, you know, putting them in the spot, I think too many people get kind of a kick out of that of kind of got you in, and I think we really need to, to stop doing that entirely. No one knows everything. Everybody was, right? So like, there's, there's, there's no way that anybody should be expected to know everything. And it's, the more senior you go, the, the, the more you're expected to know somehow, which is, 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 is interesting when you, th when you think about it. Just tying that API story to policy, it was, we wanted the Department of Education to develop a read-write API for the FAFSA form. And so what we do well in government is what I call retail digital. So we, we build websites, and we want to get people to fill out this free application for financial aid, right? especially from underprivileged environments, because uh, they're undermatching to four-year institutions. And, and yet we don't think about, well, hey, could we use KIPP schools or a nonprofit that deals with the Hmong community in Minnesota or you know, all these different uh, um, intermediaries and groups, kind of like veteran service organizations, that might be able to help students and their families fill this out. So we don't do wholesale digital government very well. And we were having trouble trying to communicate this as a policy idea to the Department of Education. And we realized we had to back up a step and actually find a safe environment to teach about APIs and, and APIs that actually you could, you could write systems to. So you could have trusted inter intermediaries that would uh, right to these systems. Is that really the way to tie it back? So speaking of creating a safe space to learn, what about a safe space to fail? Where have you seen this? Yeah, this is, I think this topic has come up a lot this week where people are like, but what if I do my like pilot thing and then it fails and then my thing is over? I was like, well, uh, I think it's actually an incredible trust building situation if you set up a pilot with exit criteria and you say, oh, I tried that for a week for $5,000, whatever it may be, and it didn't work. And look, I still have my job. I am not, you know, the world has not ended. The, the sky has not come down. Because I think government, uh, and our book is not just for government, but it's a government audience, like, is not really designed to support people failing publicly and saying that they did it. Um, I also, we have a, a tactic in the book about uh, using a thesaurus. So maybe don't call it a failure. <laughs> uh, you know, call it an iteration or a brief test or a pilot or some other word that is like safe in your space in your space to try something. Um, one of the tactics too is around defining your success criteria and your exit criteria. So a defining them because most people don't do that, and b perhaps defining them differently. So if I am doing a pilot. I'm going to commit to other people who are skeptical or worried I'm going to come after their budget and their resources or worried that my thing is going to disrupt their world. That, hey, if I don't hit this benchmark by this date, I'm going to stop. And so that creates a sense of safety. And then also, though, if I hit this success metric, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to get money or budget or comms or whatever it may be. And then I have some space in the middle where I'm going to iterate before I'm going to necessarily move forward. I presume one pager is coming handy for something like that. 
I'm a big fan of one pagers. I would tell it to, to Marina way too much. When I still, I got an email from Tom Khalil asked me for one pager yesterday. I sent him a 45 pager and he did not want me to do that. Uh, there's a lot of talk um, in the White House. There's a lot of talk in agencies. And, and uh, you know, talk is, is cheap. Uh, I would say, great, you know, can you, can you send me a one pager? And the, the reason one pagers are super helpful is you can pass them around. Uh, you can also use them to build uh, consensus and feedback. So instead of sending a one pager about a particular thing that you want to do, it could be a policy, it could be a project initiative, budget request, whatever, uh, but to ask for feedback rather than permission, right? It gets back to the carrot and the social proof. And so, and, and it wasn't a one pager, but in the context of the, the uh, 21st century VA, this vision document that, that Marina did, she got feedback on it um, and so that when she finalized it and it got to Secretary Shinseki, she had the implicit consent and support of, of a lot of the senior leadership. So I'm a big fan. It's also a good way to test folks, right? Is people come in and they say, hey, you know, I want your help, I want your support on X, Y, Z. It's like, okay, great. Can you send me a one pager? Because if it, if it doesn't have the problem, the solution, a really good anecdote or fact or statistic that backs that all up, and told in a way that busy executives can understand, then how am I supposed to be able to socialize it across a large organization? And there, there's other ways to do this too, like uh, public URLs and short videos, but like a one pager is pretty classic, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's, uh, and it lets you be ready to take advantage of like a change in leadership or a crisis. I mean, so many people think of bureaucracies as totally static and that is just not true. They are changing things every single day and people move around a lot whether departments or roles, and even if it's a deputy secretary becoming a secretary, they now want to go on their 90-day listening tour. They now want wins or new priorities. And if you have something that's like ready to go, um, then you are, have a much, much better chance of maybe it wasn't the right time last year or the year before, but maybe now is the time to, to move. Yeah, I know that came in super handy. The Tech Talent Project put together in partnership with so many others, the Memos for Tech Transition. Uh, as part of the start of this administration. And I, I hear that it was very helpful to the people that were just starting in their new roles. Okay, question. What would you advise are the limits of hacking with technology? Are there certain types or categories of problems that don't lend themselves to being hacked? Um, I think every problem is worth looking at and seeing if there are ways to fix it. Obviously, we don't use hack in our book in the sense of like hacking, like breaking in and stealing people's information, like don't do that. That would be a limit probably. Breaking the law would probably be a limit. You might be able to change the law, that's harder. But um, I think though with hacking with technology, too many people view technology as the solution. I think you should think of technology as a Trojan horse to get your solutions across the finish line. Um, technology is never by itself the solution. Uh, it needs to be a way to change processes for the better against KPIs um, that usually don't exist too. Yeah. yeah, we mean we mean hacking in the positive sense of like a, a, a tip or a tactic or a way to get something done. Uh, the best hacks in our mind not only advance your particular project, but also make systemic change. Mm -hmm. I love that. So we have a few minutes left before we end the live stream. What would you like to leave the audience with in terms of, of your book and your stories and, and the hope that you have that these stories will bring to people's lives that will be reading your, your hacks? Yeah, um, you know, I am often treated like some sort of wizard or something when I solve problems, and I just want people to know that I have no secret wizard skills. <laughs> uh, we wrote the book to say, like, anybody, wherever you are, you can follow a claim from start to finish. You can follow a case or a person from start to finish and identify where the broken handoffs are and find solutions. You can advocate for people who don't have a voice um, wherever you are, like you have a lot more power than you may think, and bureaucracies can and do change. And I mean, they can change for the worse, but they can also change for the better. Um, you know, the VA won a SAMI for customer experience on Tuesday. Thank you, SAMI team. Yay, SAMI. Um, and it and vets.gov won one two years ago. And like, wow, was that on my vision board in 2012? <laughs> uh, I was just hoping to get like you know one little form into the cloud. And so I think um, hopefully we have a message of hope that uh, wherever you are, however broken your bureaucracy is, and I think like VA, White House, we have some pretty dark ones, uh, they can really change for the better if you just kind of start one step at a time and understand what problems you're really trying to solve. Yeah, uh, 
I guess the, the thing I would say is um, too often we start to see constraints as fixed. And you know, all of these organizations are, are a set of humans and humans creating rules and processes and, and, and so forth. And like, these are all fixable. These are all changeable. They're all modernizable, whatever kind of verb you want to use. It, you know, human, be human beings created this organization and so we can change this organization. And so the trick is not all the time, you know, not everything all the time at once. You kind of have to pick your spots and sometimes it does, it does take a crass or it does, it does sometimes take a crisis or something like that. Uh, um, but these, these constraints are more uh, variable than you might think. And so I, I spend a lot of time with early career and students and I'm encouraging them to be ambitious and to ask why and question whether it's a fixed or a variable constraint. Thank you. Well, if you haven't bought your book yet, please do. There's a lot of tips and hacks that you could use to hack your bureaucracy. I appreciate you. For Thank you guys so much time. for coming and good luck. You can do it. Thank you on the live stream.